Well, the role of downtown libraries has changed over the years. No longer is it all about people quietly reading or doing research. While that still happens, downtown libraries now frequently are being asked to deal with mental health episodes, violence, drug overdoses. Just last week, the Regina Public Library was forced to close its doors temporarily to allow staff time to process a stabbing that happened on the property the night before. Unfortunately, this kind of incident is becoming increasingly common. Ask any downtown library across Canada, they'll tell you the same thing. Libraries are increasingly being asked to pick up the slack when there's a rise in homelessness, poverty, addictions, and as the social safety net has frayed, libraries have found themselves filling the gap. Well, today on Blue Sky, we're going to talk to some libraries about what they're seeing on a daily basis, what kind of training they're giving their staff to best equip them to help patrons with complex needs. We'll also hear from the author of a book about library safety. But as always, we want to hear from you. How have you seen the role of libraries change in your community? What supports do you think libraries should have to be able to support all members of our community? And what does it say about our society when libraries are being asked to function essentially as social workers? Our telephone number is 1-800-716-2221, or you could email bluesky at cbc.ca. That telephone number again is ever 1-800-716-2221, or email bluesky at cbc.ca. Our first guest today is Jeff Barber. Jeff is Library Director and CEO of Regina Public Libraries. He's on the line now. Jeff, thanks so much for taking time for us today. Thank you for having us. Well, let's talk about the stabbing I mentioned that happened at the library last week. What effect does something like that have on your staff and other patrons? It's, it, it is, uh, as you say, it, it is certainly difficult and challenging, I think, it is one of those uh, one of those uh, things, as you say, in urban libraries across the country, that uh, that do come up once in a while. I think they're they're on the one hand very rare, but on the other hand, yes, they're distressing. Well, what sort of safety measures are currently in place at Regina Central Library to protect staff and customers, and to give staff the tools they need to deal with these increasingly complex issues? Um, it, it's actually a uh, a number of things, I guess, taken taken as a whole. But here, here at the Central Library, we do have we have a third party security team that that works to uh, support staff and identify behavioral issues uh, within the library. Um, we do greet everyone who comes in the front door. We have uh, video surveillance of our public areas. We also use um, walkie-talkies. Our staff carry walkie-talkies so that they can quickly uh, call security if they need to. Um, part of um, just creating a safer environment is about the configuration of space. So we review our physical spaces to determine if we need to make changes to improve safety uh, and welcoming the environment. Uh, a big part, you know, one of the one of the big parts of, of that process. Certainly, we have incident hand handling procedures for staff in all branches for major and minor incidents. But a big part, a big part of that. Uh, learning is also the debriefing with staff following an incident, uh, a very essential process where where we can uh, take an example of something that has happened and use that to learn and to and to work work in the next situation a little better. Um, we certainly here at Central Library also work with the Regina Police Service and Mobile Crisis Hotline and others to make sure they're aware of. of the kinds of uh, the kinds of situations we encounter and the kinds of support that we need. Um, we have, you know, in terms of in terms of, I guess, a very specific safety issue. But we do keep naloxone kits here at uh, at Central Library, mm -hmm. so uh, staff who are trained in uh, in providing that um, uh, on a voluntary basis uh, can can administer that. We use we use only the nasal only the nasal spray. Mm -hmm. So, so what kind of uh, issues or, or social problems are some of your clients experiencing, and how have you seen that change over the years? Well, I think in terms of um, in terms of, of some of the some of the challenges, very much, yes, there are um, there are uh, people people living rough, people living. Um, uh, People living with without without homes without without even 
places to go other than the library. Certainly, uh, yes, mental health issues. Yes, some of those uh, some of those issues with with uh, living rough. There, some of them are temporary. Some of them are are longer term. Um, but in terms and and. In terms of change over time, I would say that in, in my career, I would not say necessarily that the challenges have changed. I think those challenges, we are seeing more people with some of those challenges. So, so what gaps in the social safety net do you see libraries being asked to fill by default? Um, libraries, I think, in terms of being one of the well essentially uh you know very very much one of the last public spaces uh for people where through our our system of values and and our value of inclusion and being available to everyone and uh, and be and actively being available to everyone uh that does put libraries in, in the position of of serving as much as <clears throat> excuse me as much as if you come into the central library on any given day um you will see people engaging in any number of things, um, whereas I make coaching or story time with kids or, uh, you know, looking at a Dunlop art exhibition. So any number of things. But, but in terms of uh, in terms of some of the other the other work that we've done, certainly the library is the main access uh, to technology for many people, um, and some of those people are people who have who have some of those. Um, challenges in terms of operating within our within our society on, on a day-to-day basis and some of them don't they're, they're simply uh, using the resources so so I think in terms of libraries we are we are being asked to step up I would say largely with with services that we always provide uh, and have provided for a long time but also some of that that broader connection to society and that that ability for people to have a place to go, a place where they can um, where they can um, connect with the rest of the people in, of, in our community, a place where they can stay warm, a place where they can, I guess it's summer, a place where they can stay cool, uh, a place where they can access a washroom. So, so the the kind of more um, fundamental day to day needs that people that people have. Um, many of them are coming now to the library. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, these problems aren't unique to Saskatchewan cities. How how has Central Library adapted its services in response to the issues that we're seeing in downtowns across the country? Um, I think it's, uh, yes, as you say, it is very much, um, very much national and and, and absolutely the the entire continent in the U.S. as well. So, um, you know, I think the um, the thing about public library is is that uh, certainly the positive interactions, uh, even kind of in the central library environment and an urban environment, far outweigh any negative uh, any negative interactions. But you know, for us, in terms of adapting to that, we we have um, actually already done some reallocation of funding to create a new position. For Central Library, that that is a self and safe and welcoming coordinator, and actually that person starts in just a couple of weeks. We're very much looking forward to it. Um, we we have an ongoing relationship with Family Service Regina. Uh, they have had drop-in counseling for customers and staff for some time. We have recently added uh, two full-time crisis care workers here on site at Central Library. Uh, so we we have these. These additional supports that are, in particular, yes, supports for those who are encountering uh, the deepest kind of challenges in day-to-day, uh, day-to-day life in our in our community. We also have, um, uh, you know, new newly opened a community commons here at the Central Library that is is a space um, not necessarily. Not, not entirely dedicated to simply to simply that that function or those or those people that that but but also but it's something that is available to everyone. It's a, a place to gather, a place to relax or connect. And we have Thrive Walk-in Counseling Services operates out of there. We we have a weekly smudge there. We do orientation services for uh, for newcomers through there. So it's a it's a place for all people in the community to connect uh, with different kinds different kinds of needs. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we've also recently just made an adjustment, and if you're familiar with our with our central library, made an adjustment to our uh, entrance where rather than two entrances, we have gone down to one entrance where where kind of all customers come through the same entrance and can be greeted. I, I, I've got to ask you, though, I mean, you know, obviously every, everything you're doing there is is out of need. But how is that, because there's only so much money to go around, how is that uh, detracting from the library's sort of core role? Well, I, you know, I think, you know, to, to some degree, I guess I would, I would, I would say, I, I, yes, while, while some of these challenges in our society do, do kind of come to the library, and we are that place for everyone. Um, at the same time, I'm, I, 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 I don't think I would, I would say that it's detracting from from a library's core. Uh, kind of core work. Uh, we public libraries have for a very long time been that place where everyone have been that place where, yes, we very much associate them with borrowing books. We associate it with reference services. We associate it with a reading room and and quiet space. Um, but public libraries have not actually been only that um, for a very very long time. So being the place where community gathers, being the place where people engage, being the place where people meet other people and connect, um, that, that has been perhaps less visible in public libraries, but very much a part of what public libraries have been doing for a very long time. You know, we've seen other libraries on the prairies install metal detectors. Is that something you'd consider for the downtown branch? I, I would say... Um, I would say that that is not something that I think is necessary here. Um, when when we look at yes, uh, on the one hand, when when there is an incident, uh, sometimes it is it is quite serious and certainly, as I say, distressing. At the same time, um, I think when we when we look at um, violent incidents, when we look at an incident in a library where you know that involves more than just one person, we certainly have. What we would call an incident is someone possibly who comes into the library who has perhaps been banned, and we ask them to leave again. So while that in the library is an incident, that's not an incident that impacts someone else's um, access to the library, or someone else's uh, ability to use the library. So when we look at actual incidents where um, there is something that uh, of any kind that is an action against another person, so a theft or vandalism or... or um, in this case, uh, something more uh, kind of an assault, something a little more violent, that that really um, for our central library, at least, you know, at this point in the year, we have about 200,000 visits to this building and less than 0.1% of those uh, of, of uh, kind of of those visits becomes an incident that in any way involves any more than than uh, than one person. So, so I think the yes, the the actions and sometimes the incidents are serious. They are very very rare. Is there anything the city or province could be doing to better support people downtown and and help lessen the load on on what the library is expected to do and be? I think there's there's certainly um, uh, and as you said said earlier there is uh, as much as some of the the um, uh, social challenges that we encounter at the library are um, and as I you know not necessarily different but certainly becoming more more prevalent um, yes I think I think there are other services that would be better suited I think as much as we we are able to fulfill a role of a place to to be a place to connect, a place for people to use technology to warm up, to have a rest. Um, we we are we are not um, a social service agency fundamentally in terms of um, while we have while we have those kinds of services as I mentioned, crisis care workers that we've started this year. Um, we're not an agency that's able to connect them to all of the things that they need. We're a place for them to go, but we are not a place where they're necessarily going to find um, find help. We need to refer them to other agencies. So I think the 
the ability and the uh, just the, the having those other agencies to refer them to um, is something that we maintain partnerships with those agencies and we want to continue that. So in terms of, of more work from other levels uh, of government, yes, uh, access and availability of the services that that are really able to assist with some of these social challenges um, uh, would would I would I would say would very much help the library. Right. Well Jeff, thank you so much for your time and your candor today. Thank you. Jeff Barber is Library Director and CEO of Regina Public Libraries. And what we're talking about today is uh, the downtown library and the changing role of the downtown library. As we've heard, it's gone from uh, maybe in the day when it was full of people reading or doing research. Uh, as we just heard from Jeff, the library, especially downtown branches now, are expected to fill, fill a much greater role, uh, especially in the social services area. We'd like to hear from you today, folks. Do you go to your downtown library or do you avoid it? What do you think could be done to help libraries serve everyone in the community? And uh, just your general thoughts on downtown libraries and the challenges they face. I'm going to go to the phone lines now where Lori in Saskatoon has been waiting patiently. Hi, Lori. Hi. So, um, you know, the people at the library, just like the gentleman who is talking, um, they're very helpful, kind, gentle, mostly women. Um, I remember going to the Lakewood Library, and the librarian asked me, D does his smell bother you? And I said, well, he has some smell, but no. I didn't want him kicked out. He was, he was gentle. Uh, people were coming, a few, you know, young men were coming to sleep because it's safe and and quiet and everybody there is you know reading and whatnot um this is just getting completely out of hand um today on cbc the the police chief in montreal was talking about going and staying five days with the uh, homeless but here's the problem i lived in the Montreal area, and there is some very, very serious crime, um, terrible crime that goes on. And we do need our police to deal with the worst people in our society. And same with the hospitals. The hospitals end up with people who've been left out with frostbite and malnutrition and all kinds of things that shouldn't be happening. And it's a very expensive way to look after are homeless. And now the library is, you know, uh, one of the only places for some of these people. Meanwhile, you know, mental health uh, psychiatrists are rationed, and I know this for sure, for mm -hmm. absolute. Um, um, the um, people, the doctors will tell you that different specialties are rationed, and one of them is psychiatry. Um, and so we need our police for, we shouldn't be doing social services uh, this way. It's, okay. it's wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for the call. Thanks for patiently waiting. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Let's hear from Clem in Saskatoon. Pardon me, Clem in Saskatoon. Hi, Clem. Yeah, hi, Garth. Uh, I appreciate this topic. I agree with your last caller 100%. Uh, I go to the library to use special computer equipment that uh, I don't have, I can't afford at home, and I've been doing it for years. Uh, the library really has changed over the last maybe 12 years. 12, say 12 years ago, you hardly got any street people in there at all, and now uh, every day it's uh, quite a few street people in there, and uh, a lot of them are kids, a lot of them are teenagers. Maybe they had fights at home or something, or they decided to to, to sleep outside with. They're home. A lot of them are homeless people. Mm -hmm. I don't believe they belong in there, and I'm uncomfortable. Uh, our special equipment is on the main floor, and that's where a lot of these homeless people end up coming in and going down to the other side of the library to use a computer or whatever. Uh, often there's a yell. Almost every time I'm in there, there's someone is yelling, and uh, it it makes me nervous. Uh, yeah. They used to have one. They used to have one security guard in there. Then they got commissioners in there, and now they have real security people in there who know how to fight and handle tough, tough things. I, I have great sympathy for, for homeless people, 
and and people with mental health problems, but but they don't belong in the library. They belong in a in a center. There there should be a center for these people, with social workers, and uh, they can grab a coffee. They can cool off in the summer. They can warm up in the winter. They can use a bathroom. Uh, there should be a, a place for these people to go other than the library because uh, they they don't really belong in the library. Mm. And the li- they're they're stretching the library's uh, uh, staff to the limit to deal with these people. And, and I know some of the staff. Uh, and uh, uh, while I haven't talked to them very much about it, uh, I know it's 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 troubling for them. So uh, that's my opinion. Thanks, Clem. Thanks for the call. Thanks, Garth. I'm going to share a couple of emails and then we'll move on. Uh, this one from Donna in Saskatoon. I avoid the downtown library. In fact, I avoid downtown. There was a time when you could go to the library and feel safe. Now drug addicts and violence is the norm. The downtown library should be avoided. Library workers are not social workers. And if they're expected to fulfill that role, they should not only be paid accordingly, but have full-time security for their protection. There are fewer and fewer areas of the city where a person can feel safe, so the downtown area should be avoided. And that came to us from Donna in Saskatoon. Uh, David, uh, this is just a shout out to librarians. David writes, in using libraries in different cities, countries, and continents for over 60 years, I have found librarians to be unfailingly the nicest, most helpful of people. That came to us from David. And let's take a quick call from uh, Janice in Regina. Hi, Janice. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to uh, tell a story about... uh, what happened to me as a former employee of the Central Library. Um, It was around 1972, uh, and I was working in the film department of the main branch. And we offered a service that we would uh, preview 16 millimeter film for people that were interested in renting these films. And it so happened that a homeless uh, fellow came in and he decided that he wanted to preview film. And our setup was that there were only two employees in that department and often only one at a time. And our screening room where we showed these films was uh, long, uh, dark, and uh, small, maybe held 12 people. Anyway, he would point to our catalog of what film he wanted to see, and I obliged by saying, okay, come into the screening room, sit down, and I would show him the film. Well, he decided this was something that he liked to do, so he decided to come every day, and he would just point to a different uh, film, and finally I said to him very nicely, I said, I'm sorry, I can't show you a film every day. Um, That's not what this uh, department is for. Um, I, you know, I'm sorry, please don't ask me to show you a film every day. And he got very angry and threatened to kill me. Uh, it was it was very scary because at that time I lived very close to Central Library and I walked home after work and of course in the morning as well. And I did report it to my supervisor. So the next time he came in, he was very persistent. Um, she tried to speak to him, and he did the same thing. He threatened to kill her. And it, it, was, uh, it, it was very upsetting and, of course, scary. So <laughs> things like that happened uh, even in those days. Yeah, that's like 50 years ago, isn't it, Janice? Yeah. I hate to point that yeah. out, but okay. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it, uh, and we had other incidents that I won't go into, but that was yeah. the one that came to mind for me because it, it was very mm-hmm. scary and yeah. there was no security. And even though my supervisor tried her best, um, you know, he, he was very persistent mm. and, um, and a scary fellow. He uh, smelt very bad. So when I was in the screening room with him, it was unpleasant and, mm-hmm. you know, obviously homeless. And I felt very bad. I, I hated to see people that, you know, had to live on the streets and had nowhere to go. Um, just like previous callers have said that they came in uh, to get out of the cold in the winter mm-hmm. and uh, out of the heat in the summer. And I, I had empathy. I understood. But when I started getting threatened, um, that, was, yeah. that was just too much. Janice, thank you for the call. Thanks for sharing that story. Thank you.
Uh, to find out more about how other libraries in other parts of North America are balancing public safety and accessibility, we've reached Steve Albrecht. He's a library security expert who's consulted and helped train staff at libraries all over the continent. He's the author of The Safe Library, Keeping Users, Staff, and Collections Secure. He's in Springfield, Missouri today. Steve, thanks so much for taking our call. Good afternoon, Garth. Thanks for having me and uh, interesting topic for me. You've been listening to the show so far, Steve. What stood out for you from what you've heard so far? Well, I've been doing this work for 23 years. I started in 2000, and maybe I had the same opinion about library safety that other people did, that what's going on there, just books and periodicals and literature. But actually, when I got into the work, I discovered that that staff had a lot of concerns, not only about the homeless, but the kind of the collection of homeless that have severe mental health issues and drug addiction. Both of those things in combination tend to make their behavior really problematic. And you've talked about the downtown libraries as being kind of the focal point for that. And I think what happens in libraries is they're driven by events. So, you, you know, you had the stabbing incident in Regina. You've had um, uh, a stabbing fatality in Winnipeg. Uh, we had shootings in libraries in, in the United States as recently as a couple weeks ago, just in San Diego, my former city. Uh, there was a homicide in front of the building, and uh, two people shot, one killed. So uh, we had a police officer killed in Memphis, Tennessee, going to a call with somebody with a gun inside the library. So they have become as problematic as our churches and our schools and our hospitals in terms of workplace violence and school violence. Uh, you know, I've, I was hoping that 23 years into this, this, this would not be the case, but it is. What kind of security measures are our most common in downtown libraries? Yeah, the biggest thing we see is usually a contract security. Sometimes cities or counties will will uh, contract with in-house security providers, oftentimes provided by sheriff security officers who are oftentimes armed. But it's usually uh, contract security. They're usually t- uh, unarmed in these situations. Uh, occasionally, they will contract with the police department. Uh, City of Los Angeles contracts with LAPD for that. Um, that's kind of a worst-case scenario for libraries because, you know, I understand the the sense that that library people and staff don't always want to have the police in the library. I say the same thing all the time. We're not always going to need the police in the library, but we are going to need the police in the library. Mm -hmm. We uh, we know that, uh, for instance, you mentioned the Winnipeg incident, and after that, uh, Winnipeg adopted metal detectors at the largest library in, in that city. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've, I've been in contact with uh, Kathleen Williams, who's the, the Winnipeg uh, Library Director, and she's doing her best to, to keep a safe environment there. I think the, the metal detector uh, process is probably not going to last there, if I if I think about it. It's an inconvenience for, for uh, patrons coming in. And also, uh, you know, what we're trying to send a message to, to people is don't bring knives into the library, obviously, and don't, don't fight and assault people in the library. But I think, you know, what, what you've heard today is how difficult the balance is. You know, librarians are not supposed to be social workers, but that's the way they feel their job is. I, I look at the trade-off be, between behavioral compliance for everybody and the fact that there are certain people that just violate the rules and put other people at risk and can scare staff and patrons. Those are the people we're trying to address through training and also in a sense of assertiveness in the library staff, which can be difficult sometimes. Um, we, we, we heard from Jeff about some of the training his librarians receive. What kind of training is needed for staff when it comes to keeping libraries, librarians, and patrons safe? Yeah, the three things that I do are service, security, and safety, and those are really three different parts of the total process. Uh, a lot of it is around de-escalation skills, especially with people that have mental health issues, mental illness, and certainly substance abuse, both of those things in combination. The other part is just service skills, empathy, patience, for a population that's not very patient sometimes in terms of their demands and, and also the sense that uh, a lot of people, and this is a phrase you may hear a lot, is that, that they come into public environments like this, they have a trauma background. They've been in a traumatic uh, situation in their lives, and that makes them angry. It makes them fearful. It makes them frustrated. Uh, it can make them demanding. And so, you know, part of my conversation with library staff is to say, look at who you're dealing with. We can't change their personalities when they come in. Let's talk about how being safe, physical space and distance, um, you know, kind of psychological self-defense and also this assertiveness that can help them feel better about dealing with this population day after day after day. Um, we're going to take some calls in a moment, uh, Steve, but I, I'm just curious. You, you talked about some uh, libraries in, in the states that have full-time police presence, and we know that um, uh, security of some kind or other has become more common than not here in, in libraries in Canadian cities. But what can the effect of that be? Will, will people still feel comfortable coming to the library, especially if they're from groups that have been historically mistreated by police and security? I think that's the balance for libraries. Uh, we, we, we want the best 
security posture, whether it's, it's cops or security officers. I always say to library directors, look, if you're not getting good service from the police or the sheriff, get, get new sheriff's deputies or new cops in here. Um, you know, if you're not getting good service from the security officers who are, who are service oriented and pleasant and, and helpful with kids and people of color and elderly and homeless and mentally ill, things like that, then get, get new people in here and tra keep transferring the right people into these positions. It takes a certain skill set. Not every cop has, it takes a skill set that not every security person has. So I believe that that right fit for, for the, the process, because when we have that in the, in the library where, where staff feel safe and patrons feel like the, this encounter with law enforcement or with, with security is going to be positive, then, then it's good for everybody. Okay, let's uh, hear from uh, a few listeners. We'll start with Agatha in Saskatoon. Hi, Agatha. Hi, good afternoon. Go ahead. Yeah, I uh, actually was over at the library like three weeks ago, and it, to me, I see there's the activity, like they do need the uh, cops downtown, library because mm -hmm. of the uh, I would say the trafficking I am First Nation and to to be first hand and see the opportunity for anyone that really wants to help and advise you know they need elders they need a lot of support services immediately, not like when anything goes bad. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of uh, mental health and addictions where the the, the gangs have uh, overpopulated their services at the libraries. And, you know, with, with so much money they put into policing and with taxing, with, uh, with taxing certain individuals, they need to learn to, um, you know, spend more money into mental health. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Agatha. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 a theme has developed here, Steve, and that is that, that basically libraries, and particularly inner-city libraries, have by default become, well, uh, expected to deliver social services that they're not really equipped or trained to do. Uh, is that the case? I mean, you just heard from Agatha and her concern for gangs basically overrunning the library. Is, is, that, is, that, a, is that common? One of my colleagues is Ryan Dowd. He wrote a book for the American Library Association on uh, homelessness in the library, and it's kind of a guide for, for library professionals. And one of the things he says is that being homeless is boring, and uh, homeless people go to the library to get intellectual stimulation. I get that. It's also dangerous to be homeless, and, and not only the weather issues, but certainly being preyed upon by other predatory people and other criminals, mm -hmm. and that's why they go to the library as well. So I get that. So I'm empathic to the issue. I always focus in my work, especially in training on the business impact. You can come into the library as long as you don't hurt the business of the library. What's happened is, and you've heard from callers and, and the discussion you had with Jeff, is that, you know, that certain people come in and a small number of people can be really problematic. It makes the staff afraid. It makes people afraid to, to use the library. So it's really that balance. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear social uh, workers and crisis counselors are in the library. I'm glad to see securities in the library. Not every library needs that but certainly urban and downtown libraries that have these types of issues do. The message we want to send to the community is it's a safe place to work, it's a safe place to go to, safe place to bring your kids, but also the message to problematic or predatory people is don't come to the library and you know cause problems that, that can get you arrested. And so that balance point of keeping a safe place for a public space where we can't choose our customers, we get who walks the door, is, is the goal. Okay, I want to hear from Grace in Saskatoon who used to work at the library in, in that city. Hi, Grace. Hi, I worked there like 20 years ago as a, a library assistant, and I would say the biggest problem we had at that time was older people who would come and sleep in the reading room and then urinate in the chairs, so that there was constantly having to clean that up or, you know, deal with it. What I think about is we have... I also know that the proximity of places like the living room, the reading room, 
the main floor bathrooms and things to the entryway where they're seen by they they can be seen and greeted and known by somebody there as they come in is very important and uh, and that now there are social workers and people that can be called. Um, I hope in the design of the new library, they are taking that into account to make sure that these areas are available because, I mean, you're right. A lot of people are just really bored and they want yeah. to look at magazines or newspapers or, you know, talk to them. I, I, I don't think they'd get the same a feeling a good feeling about going to okay we'll go to this place where you know it's a big hall and you can have coffee and you can sit and talk to other people i i think that some of them really want to just be in a more in a different kind of thing but we do mm -hmm. need to accept the fact that they will need some direction mm -hmm. And we need more bathrooms. I mean, I will say personally, I will, unless I have an event down there, I'm not going to use the lower level bathrooms yeah. Yeah. because it's too isolated. And, you know, but there, I think just, yeah, just yeah. Be, realize that a lot of them don't really want to create problems but if they come to see it as a place well you know maybe i should be able to get a cup of coffee or something then we're changing it but okay. i think that i think they're doing i'm very impressed and i as long as i stay close to certain places i feel very safe and and happy to use the library All right. and i think they're doing a good job thanks grace thank you bye-bye um uh, Steve, um, both uh, Regina and Saskatoon coincidentally are in the process of building new downtown libraries. Given, you know, everything we've talked about today and, and, and the, the real on-the-ground role of the library, what, what could be done at the design phase or, or the building phase to help everybody? Yeah, Garth, when you, I do site security surveys of libraries, and one of the things we find most problematic is we have a lot of nooks and crannies, a lot of stairwells, the lighting is not great. Some of these buildings were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They have kind of a boxy design where it's, you know, shelves and things create hiding places. So the, the more open the library is in terms of the design, we see, you know, a lot of natural light and things like that. And the sense that that staff vigilance can be easier from a positions where their their uh, circulation desks and reference desks are, are put in places where they can see all around the library. Um, certainly technology is a big, big part of it. We're using cameras now a lot. Uh, some libraries have personal panic alarms for their staff. Some libraries have panic alarms at the desk, which sometimes ring to law enforcement or ring to security. All those things are being built in now. I also look at the design for the use of the web of, uh, of internet where people are using the screens and and they can do it in a place where there's some staff surveillance. Uh, you know, certainly worried about um, pornography and child mm -hmm. pornography and things like that, the access. Um, the technology part of libraries now has really become an issue of, of, of how we are using Wi-Fi's and how people are bringing their own devices in and even thumb drives and things like that in terms of, you know, ransomware and, and uh, things that are related to cybercrime. So that's a concern as well. So, you know, let's make the technology work for us in terms of, of camera systems and things that make it easier for staff to see what's going on and also for the, for the security response to be reasonable. Uh, based on what they're seeing. And also the design of the library is open that so there's good visibility all, all throughout. Okay, let's hear from Florence and Regina. Hi, Florence. Hi there. Um, the problem is not unhoused people using the library. The problem is that a growing number of people are unhoused. Mm -hmm. And this is an issue that needs to be addressed by all levels of government. For example, there are currently 700 empty Sask housing units in Regina. Why isn't the province making them available? And then in June 2022, Regina City Council passed a motion for full operational funding to solve homelessness, then at budget time and ignored this motion. I mean, what kind of society are we that there are thousands of people suffering on our streets? We're all responsible. We all need to demand an end to houselessness. All right. 
Good point, Florence. Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's move on to Scott in Saskatoon. Hi, Scott. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm in Saskatoon, but I was recently in Halifax and saw their new library there. I was very impressed by it. And uh, I think no one really has spoken about getting more people into the library. That's, I think that's really, you know, it's safety in numbers. When there's only a few people in the library and other people are using it for sleeping, well, that's kind of scary. But when there's a lot of people in there, it's not a problem. So what they do in Halifax, they have like... Um, a couple of different places where there's concessions there. You know, you can buy coffee or mm-hmm. bun or something like that. So, and I didn't, you know, it's just it's just a very warm and friendly place. There's a lot of services for different groups. So to try to draw people into the library, I think we have to do the, more of that, yeah. uh, okay. you know, just to get the numbers there. The same, same with their transportation system in Halifax. Their buses are full on Sunday morning. You know, they, they do a wonderful job. Why can't we be, uh, you know, learning from them and doing something like that? All right. When the buses are empty, it doesn't help. Right. All right, Scott, thanks for the call. Thank you. And uh, finally, let's hear from Norma in Saskatoon. Hi, Norma. Hello, Norma. Okay, I think we lost Norma. Um now, uh, Steve, you have visited a lot of libraries. Is there one that you think has, has found the balance between safety and accessibility? You know, if you look in the biggest city in the United States, I would say New York City has done a really good job, especially in Manhattan, in terms of their libraries. They have a really good security staff, very empathic um, in terms of the number of incidents and problems that they have. New York City, you, you'd think the library would be a, a focal point for a lot of uh, conflict and violence and things in libraries. It's not. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida has uh, uh, also a very good library system for that in terms of protecting staff and the patrons and, and providing services. So I think there are places around the United States and and I'm hoping in, in Canada as well and listening to what Jeff had talked about, the things he's trying to do. You know, I, I'm, I'm Garth, discouraged if I look at sort of personal uh, safety and violence in general in, in society. Uh, all the years I've been working in this this area is 30 years. I'm, I'm hoping for better. Um, I, I'd like to see more of a sense of uh, um, addressing the same issues your callers talked about, mental health, um, drug addiction, and the fact that, that uh, people that have both of these issues can be really problematic in their behavior, not just in libraries, but everywhere. So until we address those things, uh, you know, we're going to see these same types of incidents over and over again, especially involving edge weapons, which tends to be the, you know, the weapon of choice in, in libraries. Yeah. Okay. Let's take one last caller before we have to go. It'll be Gaylene in Saskatoon. Hi, Gaylene. Hi. How's it going? Pretty well, thanks. Um, We're quickly I'm, running out of time. So Good, good. I'm calling to say that I totally agree with Florence, that we need to deal with the problems, the reason the, that people have nowhere else to go, that they they have problems dealing with being in public. We need to deal with homelessness. We need to deal with mental health. We need to support people who are unable to at this point, and that okay. will solve the problem. Thanks, Gaylene. Okay, Norma called back. Uh, got about a minute, Norma. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, I was in the downtown, walking to the downtown library just outside it in Saskatoon. Uh, I was accosted and hip checked and shot by four Indigenous young men and two Indigenous young women. They told me that I had um, uh, bleep, bleep, bleep stole their land and that I had bleep, bleep, bleep stole their children and sent everyone to residential school and they were going to get me. And um, I will never go to the downtown library in Saskatoon again. All right. Norma, I'm sorry that happened and to you. Thank I you. Think that, and they were, they were, yeah. this is what they're told. They're blame. blame yeah. Okay, Norma. White people. Okay. Thanks, Norma. Um, Steve, uh, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing your expertise with us today. It's, uh, it's uh, quite, quite the issue, and thank you so much for your help. Thanks, Garth. Take care.